Well, hello. I am back and I've taken an extra day off to reevaluate. So on Sunday, I was uh, very upset at the show and I couldn't figure out why. And part of it was because I was continuously rewatching the episode and then reading the book chapters and then comparing and then going back and forth. And the more I watched and the more I read and the less they lined up, it was getting very, very difficult for me to appreciate what the show is trying to do, which is bring a fantasy series to life and put it in a visual way that can be appreciated by a lot of people and going one for one with the book is not it's not possible at this point in time if they were to animate it they could probably do that that would probably be a, a better a better format to bring the whole thing to life and you would still have struggles with like internal dialogue and things of that nature so what I decided to do is take all day yesterday and all day today off um, from all media. I didn't watch the show. I didn't read the books. I didn't even have music playing. I wanted to kind of decompress emotionally and back away and get a better picture of, of what I wanted to talk about. And what I want to talk about is that the Wheel of Time show in its current format is objectively a good show we take we take a couple minor details at in season one episode one and change them from the book and then we get to see that path that path that they follow and that the path that they follow makes drastic changes as we go along and i do want to talk about them but I'm trying to avoid talking about it in a negative way. I even thought about like trying to figure out how to put a, uh, a counter to see how many times I say, well, it's not like the books, but then I would start talking about it and I would get irritated for doing that. So I'm going to avoid that. And what I want to talk about is my show map. And this is also this stream in particular is also a test to see what constitutes a copyright strike because I don't have any music from the show. I don't have any audio from the show. What I did do was take screenshots because I see that all over TikTok, all over YouTube, all over Facebook. Anywhere I go, I see clips from the show and they're actual moving clips. So my theory is, is if you can do moving clips, I think I should be able to do screenshots from the show with no problem. Uh, I guess we'll find out. This is a relatively new account, and it doesn't have real, any real bearing on uh, whether I'm successful or not. This is, uh, this is a trial to see if I even like doing this kind of thing. And so far, it's been good. I've, I've been enjoying it. So that being said, uh, let, me, let me make a mark to show that I'm done uh, giving my intro. I'm still learning about a lot of this. So let me dive in as soon as I hit this add stream marker. Okay, we're going to talk about season one, episode three of the Wheel of Time. And what I want to talk about is I've got some pictures pulled up. I've got my show map here. Uh, first, I wanted to go to my show map and kind of kind of start us back here and talk about how the timeline of this show differs from the book and I will just start with the very mine most minute detail and then uh, and then take the journey that the show is taking us on what if what if these details were different what if these details were different how does the wheel how does the wheel and the pattern kind of shape and mold to what the wheel needs to bring balance back to what is, is it wants to happen. I say it wants, uh, the wheel doesn't have, it's more defined as like balance. And if you change uh, too many details, just for an example, if the dragon reborn was found and killed, 
the wheel the wheel would immediately spin out another dragon. I mean, it would be almost immediate, assuming you know things things go differently. Um, it's it's a pretty interesting concept. So I'm choosing to interpret this edition, uh, this this wheel of time format as a different path of the wheel and i just kind of want to follow it and see how it plays out and so far using that mentality it's been more enjoyable so <clears throat> first we have um i'm going to zoom in here and i apologize if you can't see it this is more for my reference than anything else just so i can talk about it uh, and have a visual so there have been a few critical details that put us on this this different timeline from the show from the show from the books so the critical details are that tom marilyn is not in the two rivers the on the night of winter night for bell time um moraine sadai gets injured and <clears throat> nynaeve is taken out of the picture completely that night. She gets grabbed by a trolloc and taken off. And as far as we know, she's dead. So long. And those three details shape the story of this show in a way that has drastic changes. And what I want to do is kind of follow that. And I'm going to be bringing up some things. And I also want to talk about the character the characters in the show are very, very, very close. And that's kind of what I want to talk about. I don't want to focus too much on whether it's different or not. There's going to be some changes. But I want to talk about what I see so far. So, obviously, spoiler alert, Nynaeve survives. We got an opening scene with Nynaeve. And Nynaeve is being drug off by the Trollocs. <clears throat> and... She, we see from the cutscene of, of the end of episode two that Nynaeve has uh, tracked Lan, which is hilarious. And where are my friends? Where, where are my friends is her demand. She's not threatening him. She just wants to know where her friends are. She's survived a lot and needs to know where her friends are. And I, I like it. That's very, very on character for her. She's very protective. Um, so I'm going to go here. This is my first screenshot to test the copyright strike process for Twitch and YouTube. So the reason I screenshotted this is I kept looking at like the abs. You can't, I don't think you can see me. I kept looking at like the abs of the Trollocs and they all look the same. And so I was like, man, that's disappointing. They're, they're tall, they're right height, but you know, there's not enough differences in their features and then i saw this scene and i was like oh okay so we've got we've got bull horns on one we've got uh some, a different set of horns on the other one and the one that has the bull horns has another set and their maw their maws are different their faces are different very good that's very very good um <clears throat> they don't have language in the show yet they may they may decide to correct that if they have like a plot reason to do it but right now it's a lot of very animalistic screeching, which is still on point. When they get in a frenzy, they're uh, very much not understandable at all. Uh, it's very, very hard to, for them to speak uh, the common tongue that everybody else can understand. Um, okay, moving on. I want to point out a very um, minor detail, and I can, I can explain it. I can explain it, why the show did it, um, at least I think I can. Um, my, okay. All right, so I'm using Microsoft Paint. It's the uh, greatest tool known to man. So we, here we have, um, here we have a Trolloc in waist deep water, which I find amusing because in the, in the previous episode, and in the, you know, in the literature or whatever, they will not get in there. So how do we explain this? Uh, one is there is a fade present. We saw it. 
we saw what the fades can make the Trollocs do. Um, and, you know, we, we see that they can be forced to do something that they don't want to do. And we can apply that logic here. Technically, no, but for the show's purposes, as far as we know, Nynaeve is a candidate for being one of one of the people that could be the Dragon Reborn or a Taviran. Either in either case, they're valuable to the shadow and they're valuable to the light. And so we want that person at all costs. So the Trolloc hops in the water and uh, gets shanked by Nynaeve, which I also find hilarious. She actually grabs his knife from behind and just starts going after him. She is a, a vicious woman. And I don't think we ever see any hand-to-hand -hand combat from her, but I, she's fierce. She's a fierce character, and this is a good a good show of it. I also like the uh, the assassin type visuals, like she's got the creep up from the water, her braids just kind of sh sheeting off the water, and then she just gets them. Uh, okay, so let me. I'm just gonna be turn, getting rid of those as I go. Uh, the next scene is that I wanted to show you is uh, a visual that you probably saw from episode one, but maybe you don't know the significance of it. So I wanted to show it here. Uh, here's a screenshot of uh, right before, so Nynaeve has, has uh, killed the Trolloc, right? She stabs them in the back and then, she stabs them in the back and then they both fall in the water and then this blood forms this, this shape. And you may have seen this shape in episode one with the sheep land finds the sheep and we see the sheep in that shape uh, that sheep shape and this blood shape are both what's called um, the dragon's fang so it's called the dragon's fang it has a very negative connotation in this in this uh, particular part of the timeline um, the the dragon's fang is supposed to symbolize evil, like if the town is suspicious of someone, or if the white cloaks are in town, or something of that nature. The dragon's fang can be scrawled on like a door, like carved in there, and then now everybody's suspicious of that person. Uh, it doesn't have any real, real bearing uh, here. It's just a nice, it's just a nice what I call breadcrumb or Easter egg. Um, and I just wanted to explain that a little bit. So we move on, we've got our next scene, let me just check my notes real quick. Um, what happened? Oh, so the next, the next scene is we cut back to Nynaeve and Lan and Moraine. And they're kind of talking about um, talking about how Nynaeve tracked Lan, and you know what is he? Um, Lan is very desperate to get Moraine better. Now I have some I have some like canon questions or some um, like how the how the show magic system works as far as like how they can explain it, but. Unless, unless Moraine was like damaged by a, a Thakandar blade, a blade from Sheogul, the way uh, Tam is, then like that that bond between Warder and Aes Sedai, which hasn't been explained well yet, is like a is like a two way a two way street. So if one is weak and the other one is strong, and they just kind of they kind of even each other out, and my my internal explanation is that Moraine was damaged by was uh, hit by a Thakandar blade, and the only thing keeping her alive for as long as she's been alive is the water bond, and that gets put on display. Uh, I don't know if it's exactly this scene. No, it's the it's the next scene. So I'll talk about it then. Uh, next we cut to Rand and and Matt, and they're kind of in the hills. There it doesn't really. There's no real discussion about how long this is this is taking, um, but they're they're in the hills and they're lost and they're you know they're kind of upset. You can actually see Arid Hole in the background, 
So you can see that they're already making progress away from the city. And I thought that was a, a nice touch. You know, you kind of, that had to take some effort to get that shot just right. And you can see that they're traveling east because the they're facing the city or facing directly away. And then when they cut the other direction, east is that direction. It's some good, some good uh, cinema right there. Next, we have the planes. So this is going to be the, uh, let's see if I can, let's see if I can get this show map to show me what I want. So here we have uh, Egwene and Perrin. They're in the Caroline grass is, is where they're at. And Matt and Rand. And Nynaeve and Lan and Moraine. Okay, so our next scene is Perrin and Egwene. They're in the Caroline grass. And I just want to point out this. This is this is a scene where they're trying to start a fire. And the difference here, the difference here is they're missing somebody. They're missing somebody from the book. So again, we're gonna take we're gonna take the timeline. We're going to branch off and see how see how the wheel handles this this detail being missing missing and part of the detail missing here is that these wolves are have have met Perrin already they they had a scene where they licked his leg and we don't know anything about what's happening right now but these wolves are like right behind them right on their trail and Egwene and Perrin are panicking. And the last detail from season, uh, from episode one is that Perrin is married and his wife died by his hand. And he is under a lot of stress. He's under a lot of stress and he's feeling that, that here. He's panicking. He doesn't want another person that he loves to die. And so he's trying to, he's trying to start a fire. And, you know, it plays out a little different. Uh, I, I just, all I wanted to point out was that this scene is flip flop, flip flopped when the details change. So in this scene, she tries to channel and can't get it started. And Perrin makes a joke about what are you trying to channel it? Are you trying to make fire out of nothing. And then he says, I'll go make a wood bow. But in this, in this scene, they're panicking, they're under pressure. And all the details I mentioned before, and Egwene is Egwene is in a better mindset, in my opinion, partially because Nynaeve has not been like at her throat uh, like she is in the other timeline I'm talking about. So she's able to focus, she's able to channel and get that fire started. And I thought it was a good. This is a good exploration of like timeline divergence if you change just a small couple things like uh, the butterfly effect i guess is what i would call it um or what it's been called before oh uh, no i don't want to save that okay next uh next is a dream well let me make sure i'm in the right spot No, I'm, I skipped a spot. So next is Moraine and Lan and Nynaeve. And here I want to show what I want to talk about is there's a scene where Moraine is, she's got the wound and Nynaeve has already like agreed to, to help. And, and she tells Lan brace yourself. It's, it's going to hurt because that's how the water bond works in this situation. And I don't know if I lost my music or if it just is quiet at the moment. Anyways, now oh, there it goes. So Nynaeve tells Lan, brace yourself. And then it cuts to, <laughs> she's like packing the wound and then they cut over to Lan and he's just like, Maybe he like clenches his jaw. I think there's like a tiny, tiny facial um, motion. And I just think it's a good, it's a good demonstration of what kind of man 
Lan is. Lan is, uh, well, you saw, he's that kind of man. He's the kind of man that can share the pain of a wound with somebody else and have it agitated and then just kind of not even make a sound. Um, okay, so next next scene is going to be a parent's dream. A parent's dream sequence, it, I think, is done really well. And again, this is all based on this shift. So in this <clears throat> in this version, this visual version of the show, with the details that we've already discussed that were changed by Alzaman, we don't know his name yet, but the guy with the glowing red eyes knows more or less who these individual people are and has already started to single them out. And he's he's kind of tailoring tailoring these things uh, into the dream. And so we see here, Perrin wakes up in the smithy, like in the smith shop, in the in the forge and all that. And at first I didn't like this scene, and the more I thought about it, the more I realized uh, what is going on. And what's going on is, <clears throat> is the guy with the glowing red eyes is trying to instill a sense of mistrust is trying to instill a sense of mistrust into the about the wolves so the wolves in this dream is are attacking layla and then layla cuts you know looks at him while she's dead and you see the you know the guy with the glowing red eyes this whole time and it makes more sense that this this scene happens based on the person that we're missing so i think it's i think it's valid i think it's good show writing i think taking this this path is excellent let me go ahead and let me go ahead and do this take that out of there let's go to the next one so the next scene is sorry got my notes here I write the notes, the notes out for the show on a piece of paper, so I don't, I don't actually have. Uh, I guess I could take a picture of it, like I did a, in a previous episode. Uh, but I, I try to write out each scene and just kind of put who I, who I saw in there. So we've got Rand and Matt. They make it to a town called Breen's Spring. Now Breen's Spring. I didn't even know where it was. I didn't know where it was because you're reading those chapters and when you're reading the chapters, all that, all those cities blend together. And I found it. Amazon Prime, when you pause it, it gives you like these little x-ray snippets and it says Brain Spring uh, right here. So Brain Spring is, uh, is part of all these it's part of all these little towns uh, west of Camelon. And what I thought was interesting was that if you look at if you look at the map that I found, Brain Spring is south of this little this little river, and you got like a little mountain valley right here. So I think I think that the show took some creative license green spring into that little mountain valley so we could get this nice shot of them going downhill as Rand says you know he's making poking fun at Matt and I thought it was well done and so next we see this is in the same like the same characters so they make it down into green spring and then we get to meet Tom Finally, I was I was looking for him. I was upset that he wasn't in the beginning, but here he is. Who knows why he didn't make it to the two rivers? Maybe they'll explain it. Maybe they'll uh, kind of brush it off. But I would be interested in knowing if this is the the path that they're taking. How how did Tom not make it to the two rivers the way he was supposed to? Uh, we also meet a character named Dana. Dana is the barkeeper at the tavern. Or the, or the tavern keeper, whatever you want to call him. Um, and 
you know, they have a, they have a discussion and then Tom gets up on stage and is singing and his song is interesting to me. I have it here. Mm, let me just make these a little bigger so I can read it because I'm blind. Okay, so we've got we've got some interesting lyrics here, and I've been trying to I've been trying to piece them together. There's some obvious references to the dragon, um, like the colors of his morning. That is um, could be a reference to the Lord of the Morning, and then the darkness of his night. Uh, this is where I, I I'm already kind of. I'm confused about the lyrics. I'm confused about what they're actually talking about. Uh, cause I don't, this, this song doesn't really show up anywhere else, at least not yet. And not in the, not in anything that I've read so far. If you know where they're from, please tell me, that would be great. Uh, it says the darkness of his night, little graves that gave no warning. Uh, that could be a reference to the prologue and the books, a sun that brought no night or brought no light. Could be another reference. Uh, this feels like a reference to the prologue in book one. And I don't really want to talk about it to spoil to spoil that for you. But this is what it feels like. Uh, that tortured soul I met uh, in a prison of his making. The man who can't forget. This really, really feels like the prologue. I can still hear the way that he cried. For the ones he was missing i can still hear the way that he cried for the ones he had lost he saw them in the rivers he felt them in the rain in dreams he heard them whisper the truth that is his pain he caused the whole world's breaking that tortured soul i met in a prison of his making the man who can't forget so to me it could be two different people I could interpret it for two different people and both people are in the prologue. So if that was intentional, great job. I, I thought it was um, an interesting approach. Like traditionally Tom is supposed to have like a harp, um, like a traveler's harp or a, uh, a flute. And I think the guitar is more appropriate because uh, he can, he can play it by itself and he's singing. He's not like telling a story. And I don't remember seeing him anymore after this, uh, other than obviously the next episode. But I thought this was interesting. It also adds some interesting, um, like an interesting way to like, like show him on screen. We see him later when he confronts Matt, um, that they do the, the guitar strum as like, here he is, you know it's Tom. So I'm going to go ahead and move on. Uh, and before I talk about um, Perrin and Egwene's next scene, I did want to bring up like this, this other, this map clip that I had. And I was trying to draw like the path of what I, where I think they went. And it's a long way. So we've got Arid Hole over here. This is Shadar Logoth where they, where they escaped. And they made it, they made it a really far distance in a short amount of time on screen. And I'm just kind of curious, like, I think what the show is doing is just trying to cut out like the boring bits. Like, I think it would be like nice from, well, they can't, they can't really do it. What they're, what they're doing is they're just going to have to compress the distances involved and not make it seem so large. This took like, this took them like a week or whatever maybe longer i can't remember the exact times um but you know this is this is fine this is what this is what shows can do they can kind of make things happen that that you can't do in a book people who read the books get a little too stuck on the details like me um this next scene that i wanted to talk about is i don't know if it's this scene specifically but apparently we have a scene where they're getting pushed around and chased by the wolves. Like the wolves are after them and they push Egwene and Perrin onto the tracks of what appears to be a wagon. 
And so I thought that was interesting. And what's, what's interesting about it is how much sense it makes knowing what I know. And it is something that makes sense. Like the further we get into the story, the more it can be explained in hindsight. And without the character that's missing, this, this order of things that happens makes a lot of sense. So next, uh, Perrin and Egwene have found the tracks and they go into this uh, area and they run into the, the traveling people, the Tuathuan. Uh, or the tinkers and I just want to I just want to point out a couple things here one uh, Perrin Perrin realized something was wrong a split second before he going did and I think we're going to see some more hints hints of something like that to come and I also want to note point out how ugly the tinkers clothes are this is like uh, like a meme in the books it's how horrible like if, they're, if somebody's wearing like some garish, bright, ugly clothing, they're said to uh, be dressed like a tinker. And the tinkers don't care. They love the way they look. And this whole scene with the ceremony, <clears throat> again, because somebody critical is missing, makes a lot of sense. Aram is there. Aram is there for the introduction. And his character stepping in to fill the role of the person that was missing also makes sense this is i can't tell you exactly how good this show writing is when you look at it as a diverging timeline of of what happened in the books these characters are staying true to form they're being shaped by the events around them very closely to the book and and you can kind of you can kind of sense just for an example you can kind of sense aram's uh you know, contempt, not contempt, but dissatisfaction with the tinkers, like their lifestyle. Um, and I, I just wanted to point that out before I move on. Let's go to Okay, so next is going to be I believe nine or uh, Matt and Rand are inside Green Spring. And my note says splitting wood. So Rand is out there splitting wood. And Matt makes a joke that is uh, a Easter egg for anybody looking for that kind of thing. Um, Matt's excuse for not splitting wood is he's a horse trader. And that's, that's accurate. Um, that's really kind of, that's really kind of it for that scene. There's not really, not really a whole lot going on. I took this picture from, <clears throat> from earlier. And I just wanted to point out something. So we have a scene. We have a scene here where we've got a picture of, uh, the eye in the, in the cage. And I was really, really worried about this eye being in the cage. Because there's only one in the cage that I know of, and it better not be him. I guess we'll find out later on. Um, so, so this Ayoman was in the cage, and he got killed. And at some point, I mm, can't remember exactly where it's at, uh, but Tom Tom mentions that uh, this hair color is odd. It's not normally found outside of the IU. And I just want you to keep that in mind as we go through these episodes. Okay. All right, next, oh, uh, whoops. So my next screenshot is of uh, Rand trying to get out. So Dana has betrayed him. <clears throat> and I wanna point out like, oh, she was so nice to him. I thought, you know, I thought if you were gonna be evil, you were always evil. This is setting an important precedent in the show for how how hard it is to trust people in this world these these dark friends could be anybody they could be they could be a friend 
They could be anybody that anybody that you know or don't know that you run into. Any of them could be a servant for the dark. Their primary giveaway, if you could call it that, is that they are um, very selfish and very driven. So if they have like a lot of ambition or they're very, um, it's most, mostly selfishness, selfishness and ambition. I can't talk, uh, but I, that's like the primary thing, but you can't even really use that because there's lots of people that are that way that are not dark friends. And there are people that are not that way that are dark friends. And that's part of why it's so, so frustrating uh, throughout the series to see this in action. And this is a great example. She says, you know, I really didn't want to because I like you. And then she's got his sword and she's going to kill him or at least capture him. She's alerted a fade is what she says. And then um, also of note, she just before this scene right here where you see Rand uh, bust this door down, she says it would take like three men to break it down. So take that information for what you will. I think it's a well-crafted scene. Very well crafted. Okay. Next we go. Let's see. We we go to Lan and Nynaeve. And then Lan runs off and basically says, uh, Nynaeve is like, why are you leaving now? You know, basically like, why would you trust me now? And... You know, Lan doesn't really say anything, but he goes he goes to a cliff and looks down and he sees um, he sees something that catches his interest. And then he goes back to grab uh, Nynaeve and Moraine. And Moraine is uh, very peaceful looking in this scene. You know, she's our, you can already tell that she's not as pale as she's on the mend uh, or at least a little bit. And then we go to back to Perrin and Egwene. And Perrin is sad because of Layla. And I think as accurate as this is, I still don't necessarily like it, but it is accurate. And that's the that's the thing. It's accurate for the things that have happened in the show. Perrin is, Perrin is very upset, uh, both with sadness and in anger and frustration. Um, next is... Um, Dave... They've replaced they've replaced a lot of uh, the missing characters lines with Aram, and I kind of already mentioned that. Um, and I just just anything that Aram, most of the things that Aram is saying, somebody else has said that in in the canon, and I think it's interesting how those lines affect the characters in different ways. When they were said by Aram, they were taken one way, and when they were said by another character. Now that's missing, they were taken a different way. And I find that fascinating. I think it's good show writing. And I just want to move on. I'm almost almost to the end here. And I think this is a much better episode than, than the two I've done previously. I feel better about it. I feel better about... Um, I feel especially better now that the show has completely, completely diverged. And I'm interested in, in trying to to see the the path kind of be pulled back back towards center because uh, I know I know it kind of happens and the major plot points still happen and I think it's um, I think it's gonna be fun to watch my music stopped and I am upset about it where did my music go anyways so we go back to Rand and, Rand and Dana, and this is where he's strong, and he busts out of the busts out of the inn. And I've got my scenes mixed up. I'm so Rand busts out, and then what's next? So some things, some things are happening with Tom. And one of the things that 
one of the things I like is that he has he has the lore, like he understands what the IEL are, and that is that is great. He picked Matt out as a Two Rivers lad uh, immediately. That's like Tom's character, other than like his guitar and gravelly voice and his beard. Other than that, uh, he's got all the other components. Like somebody may complain, like, "Oh, the the patches." aren't on the outside of his cloak. It's supposed to be on the inside. It's supposed to be on the outside, not on the inside, but the patches are there. It's a nice touch. Um, and he's got the, he's got the cockiness when he confronts Matt, you know, he's, you know, he basically says you wouldn't even last, you wouldn't even last a second. And this is where he makes the comment about the red hair and and he also talks about the Aiel's black veil. And I think that's gonna be important for later. If you see an Aielman, based on what Thomas said, that has his veil up, his black veil up, watch out. He's he's ready to kill. And that's kind of <coughs> explained in other places uh, in a different way. I'm not sure why my music keeps stopping. This is interesting. Is it because it's at the end? No. Is it just freezing? I think it's broken, but anyways. Um, okay. Last couple scenes, uh, we go back to Dana and Rand, and Rand is, uh, I think he's in like the middle of the street and Dana confronts him again. And like, she, she knows about the others. So now we see that the, the dark friends and the shadow spawn and the fade and all these kind of forces of evil are communicating with each other, which is, which is kind of terrifying. Now you, now you know that your description and what you're doing is, is put out there before you even get there. And I think that's going to be important as we continue. And we have like a nice little, um, we have some nice little, uh, scenes, um, like this is the first time we hear the name Ishamael. I apologize for stopping so much. I really, I have some of these scenes mixed up in my head because I didn't watch the whole thing right before I started. I didn't have time. So I'm looking at my notes and trying to basically guess where I'm at in the show. Um, so this, this scene, my note says, uh, uses the power to break a door. Whoops. Spoiler alert. And then, uh, Dana is making a scene and she mentions Ishamael. And uh, she's talking about the dark one, the dark one to end it all. And I think that's an interesting comment. You really don't, you really don't hear anything like that until much, much later. Uh, you know, she's, she's kind of hinting at something that, that doesn't really doesn't really happen for a long time. And I think it's interesting that they're bringing it up now. It has implications for where the show is going in the future. And I'm interested to see it. Um, the last, the last scene, and I know this is the last scene because I watched it fully before, uh, before we, before I started. And the last scene is Moraine and Nynaeve and Lan they're traveling and Nynaeve complains that they've been traveling for three hours or somewhere around there. And then um, Lan stops and says, basically like, Moraine, we need you. And we see um, where he was going this whole time. So if we go back to the map, go back to the map, um, we've got, we've got Shatter Logoth up here. And then we have Gildon, and Gildon is where Loghain was captured. 
And so they were forced by Moraine's wound to basically travel south, either southwest or southeast. Uh, I think southeast because it's also going to be kind of more the direction that uh, they, I guess they could go to Garen's Wall. I don't think so. I think um, I think they've made it all the way down to the um, to this forest. Let me zoom in here. Of course, you don't want to load for me. How dare you? Uh, Dolan Forest. They could be there. I don't think they mention it, but I'll have to I'll have to look at it a little bit. Uh, a little bit more and see if they mention it. I don't think they do. So if you look at that, the distance is involved. Now it's starting to make more sense. So you've got Arid Hole to Breen Spring for Matt and Rand, and you've got Arid Hole to Dolan Forest, and that means that um, that means that Perrin and Egwene should be either somewhere north of here, like near, they, they kind of meet the tinkers in the forest and then they and they continue on. And oh, look where this path goes, straight to Tarvalin. So I think that's what the, I think that's what the show writers did. And I approve, I think it, I think it makes sense um, for the show writing um, to kind of shorten this, this amount of time that they're traveling. Uh, obviously with Moraine's wound, she couldn't have traveled for very long without, you know, she couldn't have traveled for eight days and then made it to the forest if that's where they were going. Um, so we also get to see Loghain here at the end. And I have a picture, picture of him. I happen to think the casting, just like the other casting so far, the casting for Loghain is, is pretty good. I, I approve. Uh, he's appropriately crazy, or crazy looking, and he's got the he's got the long black hair, and he's got that uh, that stern, you know, aggressive expression. <clears throat> and I just want to point out this right here. He has claimed himself to be the dragon, and we kind of see some proof of that right here. So for anybody that doesn't know, uh, we see this. We see this later on, and this is the symbol. This will eventually be the symbol for the dragon. Um, obviously, Loghain thinks he's the dragon, and you know we'll find out as we as we go. I am trying to get better about not spoiling what's up ahead. I'm practicing. Eventually, I want to do something like a podcast, and I can't do that right now I just don't have the I don't have the the chops for it I don't have the experience of how to how to do this in fact I you know I, I need to put another marker here right and then I've got to go back and figure out how to how to even split those videos up um, but if you appreciate this or if you like it or if you hate it or however you feel about it if you feel about it anything at all whether on Twitch or YouTube, uh, please tell me. I would really like to know how you feel about it. If it didn't catch your interest, if my tone was off, if my outlook on the show or the book is not what you want or not what you're expecting, I would like to know just so that I can decide whether I want to try to adjust anything. Uh, I have... I have uh, people that I'm around that I often have to change the way I speak to them. And so it's, it's a little comfortable for me. I may slip into like my normal mode of speech where it's kind of um, monotone, I guess, but I can add that inflection if it makes it, if the makes, if it makes the information more consumable. And that's really what I want. I want to talk about the show and explore this divergent timeline. And, and I want to do that with, with other people. And right now I can't do that if I don't have anybody to talk to. So uh, thank you. Thank you for looking at this. Anybody who looks at it after the stream, because currently there's no, there's nobody in here. It's just me. And that's fine because this is something that I've been wanting to do. And Twitch is just a tool uh, so that I can record what I want to say. So thank you. If you see this later on and uh, I'm really surprised you made it to the end. 
and I hope you have a good time.